Okay, in my lab, we uh, do uh, games for valuable prizes. So we're going to start off with a game for valuable prizes. Okay, so here we have it. Scenario one, you are collecting data at a preschool, and the preschool director has been extremely helpful in facilitating your research. She's provided space, distributed flyers, and personally encouraged parents to participate. One day, the director says to you, I see Sammy did your project. I'm glad he did because I'm a little worried about him. How'd he do? What do you do? For, oh, I, tell, I need to tell you what the valuable prize is. This is a higher education system ASHA website glass cleaner cloth in a carrying case. So who's going to be? All right. I'm thinking if the parents uh, gave permission and requested the information, they could be given the information, and that could be shared that way. Okay, you get the valuable prize of the eyeglass cleaner. The correct answer is, and again, this is the game we do in my lab, is that uh, under our IRB protocol, you may not share information with a third party without the, the written permission of the subject or the parent. Okay. Now, scenario number two. You are testing a college student who signed up for our study. He reports that he does not have a prior diagnosis involving language or learning difficulties. According to the standardized test you gave for the study, the student shows clear signs of a learning disability. In addition, he has told you about his plans to apply for grad school. If he were informed of his learning problems, he could get help through the university's Disability Resource Center and would most likely have a better chance of getting into grad school. Should you tell him that he has a learning disability? And this is for the valuable prize of a cell phone stand representing the ASHA, I can't see it without my glasses, what is it? Cell phone stand of um, academicaffairsandasha.org. Academicaffairsandasha.org. Who's, who wants it? Who's going to compete for this? I guess this is what I learned from my mentor. We are um, doing research. We are not diagnosing. We have absolutely no right of um, give them any diagnosis or what. Absolutely. Oh, and you win the valuable prize of the cell phone stand. So, and in fact, there has been a lawsuit over this very issue where somebody was given a diagnosis that they did not ask for and suffered psychological harm uh, from that experience. So that would be a big no-no. Yeah. Sorry, I was just wondering if you could follow up. A, sorry, could you follow up a little bit about what you should say, if anything, if you're if you feel like there would be harm to the person from not knowing that they might benefit from further services? Okay, in my lab, these are undergraduates testing, so their next uh, step is to come to me. <laughs> okay. All right, for our last scenario, <laughs> and uh, for the valuable prize of academic affairs and research education, a handle uh, holder for a briefcase or suitcase. This is what we're going after. Or your, yeah, your car steering wheel. Okay, Shelly, maybe you want to go after this. <laughs> okay, this one actually did happen today, but it's happened before. A college student has signed up to participate in your study because he will receive class credit in Psych 101 for volunteering as a research subject. The faculty member who oversees the Psych 101 study participation system has been complaining about labs not providing enough research opportunities for all the students that want them. When your student arrives, you read over his information sheet and you see that he is not yet 18 years of age. What should you do? Okay, there we go. Oh, I'm not handing over the prize just yet. Uh, assuming your inclusion criteria for your study are that your participants must be 18 years old, then you do not run the participant. And that would be correct for our last very valuable prize. So this is actually an exercise that we do at the very beginning of our, our uh, academic year, we have a lab party that assures people will show up, and then we go through about a dozen of these scenarios that have to do with research in my lab. So. Yeah, I just have, I just have one addition to that, and if you're teaching an undergraduate course, make sure you give alternate credit because uh, you can get into a lot of hot water 
if someone says, well, I'm not eligible, but I can't get the extra credit, now what? Yeah, we actually have a whole protocol about what happens when somebody's underage, but they still want the class credit. Okay, and, but the important thing is that your lab knows, and they know what to do in these situations. This is about establishing a lab environment for the responsible conduct of research in terms of research participants. And we need to cover this because uh, the integrity of your lab has to do with the environment that you set. And it doesn't happen by accident. You need to put a little bit of thought into this. And I got to say that everybody has been through the CITA training or whatever else your institution requires. We've all heard about the egregious um, things that have happened. Sorry. Hmm. Okay, that was supposed to be animated. So uh, that have happened over history. But the reality is, is that you're not likely to infect kids with Down syndrome with um, hepatitis C. You're not likely to not treat uh, men with syphilis over tw a 20-year pe period. Those are not IRB human subjects protection issues that are really relevant to your daily life. So instead, these are the things that come up. Okay, These are the things that come up, and you may not be present when they happen. So you need to assure that you're Sub, your, the people in your lab know how to translate these vague principles that are being illustrated by the Nazi war experiments you know, into things that actually happen when you've got a four-year-old in front of you. So uh, that's the point. So, um, so, so you need to give some thought about what kinds of things actually are likely to happen and what are the... Uh, potential IRB and, and re, uh, responsible conduct uh, scenarios and situations that they relate to and make sure that people know how to, to responsibly handle them because they come up on the fly. Okay, so what I recommend that you do is really think about what are the points of vulnerability in your own lab. So maybe this is a lab that, that is now really your lab or maybe it's the lab that, that you were in as a student. But think about where the points of vulnerability, where responsible conduct of research problems could arise and what you might do to proactively um, work with them. So these are examples that come from my lab, and I'll just highlight a couple uh, of them. So we talked about in the, the grant review periodic incidental health findings. I had one of those come up two days ago. Um, the fact that we do off-site data collection which makes us vulnerable to uh, breaches of confidentiality, um, more so than if the data was collected in our own lab. The, the uh, fact that we uh, human beings have a limited memory for verbatim information, so even if I tell people things verbatim, that is going to drift away out of their memory. And the fact that we're Americans and we do not read manuals, including lab manuals. So. Uh, how am I going to make sure that people really do know what these principles are, given that nobody's opened a lab manual in the history of my lab? So um, what we want to do is kind of within your own tables, think about what the potential vulnerabilities are in the lab you're in now and what you might do to reduce your own vulnerability to violations of, of IRB and responsible conduct of research issues. So as it says, discuss. So um, one of the things that came up was the uh, people who have appointments at multiple institutions, sorry, I'll stand up, at multiple institutions, and uh, IRB coverage for protocols at both institutions and transferring protected health information and making sure that's all kosher between the institutions. Um, the other piece had to do with training people such as laboratory managers um, in IRB-related issues. What's an adverse event? What's, what is really an adverse event? Was it really related to the research study that was being conducted? And, and trying to balance that communication with those individuals. Uh, let's go to this table. Let's hear about where a potential point of vulnerability is and maybe a strategy for handling it. How about this table uh, of vulnerability and, and a strategy for handling it? Um, so we discussed um, a vulnerability that might be a, an ethical issue as well, more so than an IRB um, violation. But um, we talked about how if you're working as a clinician and you have a patient that you'd like to recruit for your subject 
for a study, do you, as the clinician who's working with that patient, recruit, or do you have someone else? And you know, it depends on who's available to consent for the IRB, but also we talked about how ethically we usually defer from having you take that patient and have someone else who can consent do it instead. And, and the point here also is that if it's your lab, you need for people to understand, people who might be in the position to get in trouble with that, to understand what their potential role might be and what the limits of that is. Uh, we talked about a case, um, a study that involved collecting data on the um, MMSC and um, finding the... Can you define that? I'm sorry, the um, mini mental status exam um, and finding um, low scores that you would, that you then don't share that information with the participants. And how do people right? a, a lot of times the PIs know what's supposed to do and the lab manager knows what's supposed to do, but the person on the front line, that's where your point of vulnerability is. And you got to manage that point, the one on the front line. Okay, because what's to stop them from saying, oh, you're really low. You know, <laughs> you know, you know you would never do it. I know I'd never do it. But the point is I have to know that my frontline people would never do it. Well, we talked about several things. One of them is getting consent in people who have language comprehension difficulties and or dementia, anything that might get in the way of their comprehending the materials you're presenting to them. And we talked about a number of possible um, ways to deal with this. One of them is to use a formal um, measure to assess whether they're competent to consent. Another is to have a, a proxy, a place for a proxy person to sign and to always have another person with them to, to provide consent in addition to them. Um, to have, you always need to have simplified language in your consent form. The IRB usually asks for that. So, so that's a good procedure that actually manages the vulnerability. How about this table? Yeah, we talked about a couple of issues in terms of, like the one about recruiting your own patients and how you can distance yourself in research projects from that conflict of the dual role that you might have as researcher and clinician. And in one case, it required a doctoral student hiring a research assistant because she was, the doctoral student was director of a school for autism. And of course, she wanted to do a dissertation with children who have ASD. And uh, so she couldn't really know who participated and not. So the data were collected by somebody else and she got completely de-identified data. That's how we got it past the IRB. And more recently, a project similar where we're, looking at first and second generation speakers of Spanish and some of the uh, subjects will be recruited are in classes where the doctoral students in linguistics who are involved in the project are adjuncts. So the same kind of thing, you appoint a recruiter and the instructor leaves the room and then the data are de-identified so that the, the person who's the adjunct can deal with data and not know who's participated. A, a great problem and a great management plan. Anybody over here? Um, we talked about an issue of uh, long-term, or what can happen when a long-term employee has been around who might be less uh, cautious about leaving personal information about participants out and how that can be a little bit awkward or a lot awkward for new people who come in to a lab to try to navigate ways to promote change. One suggestion was just to make sure that people are doing their research training that is done annually. Um, and we also talked about the idea of one that might not be an issue if someone might, if it's not actually in a public area, then it might not be as big of a deal as uh, one might think. Okay, so I think what we've discovered here is it's a lot easier to identify the points of vulnerability than to come up with a strategy. But if all you've done is identify the po points of vulnerability, you haven't really done anything to manage your risk. And so you, you really need to, to turn to the idea of what are you doing to be proactive. You know, along those lines, we collect some of our data in our university clinic. Well, you know what? The clinical faculty wander through there all the time. So we have to think about how do we keep the research uh, privacy in a space where other people who aren't research trained in, in research integrity and responsible conduct are coming through for legitimate reasons. So think about these things proactively and have a plan.